types of cancer. But the degree to which various tumors appear to be different is the same degree to which they're benign, which means that it's the degree to which there are non-cancerous cells within it. The greater the malignancy, the more these tumors begin to resemble each other, and the more clearly they begin to take on the classic characteristics of pregnancy trophoblast. And the most malignant of all cancers, the chorion epitheliomas, are almost indistinguishable from trophoblast cells. For as Dr. Beard pointed out over 70 years ago, they're one and the same. Let's turn now to the question of defense mechanisms. Before we can hope to conquer cancer, first we must understand how nature conquers cancer, how nature protects the body and controls the growth of trophoblast cells. All animals contain billions of white blood cells. One of the functions of these cells is to attack and destroy anything that is foreign and harmful to our bodies. For this reason, it would seem logical that they would attack cancer cells also. But since cancer is trophoblast, and since trophoblast is not foreign to the body, but is in fact a vital part of the life cycle, nature has provided it with a very effective means of avoiding the white cells. One of the characteristics of the trophoblast is that it's surrounded by a thin protein coating that carries a negative electrostatic charge. The white cells also have a negative charge, and since similar polarities repel each other, the trophoblast is well protected. Part of the solution to this problem is found in the pancreas, which secretes an enzyme called trypsin. When this enzyme reaches the trophoblast in sufficient quantity, it digests the protective protein coat. The cancer then is exposed to the attack of the white cells, and it dies. Applying this to the embryo, we find that the trophoblast cells there continue to grow and spread right up to the eighth week. And then suddenly, with no apparent reason, they stop growing and are destroyed. Recent research has provided the explanation. It's in the eighth week that the baby's pancreas begins to function. Now, it's significant that the upper intestines, near the point where the pancreas empties into it, is the one place in the human body where cancer is almost never found. We note also that diabetics, those who suffer from a pancreas malfunction, are three times more likely to contract cancer than non-diabetics. These facts, which have puzzled medical investigators for years, at last can be explained in light of the trophoblastic thesis of cancer. But what happens if the pancreas is weak? or if the rate of cancer growth is so high that the enzyme trypsin can't keep up with it, then what? The answer is that nature has provided a backup mechanism, a second line of defense that can do the job even if the first line should fail. It involves a unique chemical compound that poisons the malignant cell while nourishing all the rest. And this is where the vitamin concept of cancer finally comes back into the picture. The chemical compound in question, of course, is vitamin B17, which is found in those natural foods containing nitrilicides. It's known also as amygdalin, and as such has been used and studied extensively for well over a hundred years. But in its concentrated and purified form, developed by Dr. Krebs specifically for cancer therapy, it is known as laetrile. For the sake of clarity in this presentation, however, we shall favor the more simple name, vitamin B17. The B17 molecule contains two units of sugar, one of benzaldehyde, and one of cyanide, all tightly locked together within it. Now, as everyone knows, cyanide can be highly toxic and even fatal if taken in sufficient quantity. However, locked as it is in this natural state, it's completely inert chemically and has absolutely no effect on living tissue. There is only one substance that can unlock this molecule and release the cyanide. That substance is an enzyme called beta-glucosidase, which we shall call the unlocking enzyme. When B17 comes in contact with this enzyme, not only is the cyanide released, but also the benzaldehyde, which is highly toxic by itself. In fact, these two working together are at least 100 times more poisonous than either of them separately. The unlocking enzyme is not found to any dangerous degree anywhere in the body, except at the cancer cell, where it always is present in great quantity. 
The result is that vitamin B17 is unlocked at the cancer cell. It becomes poisonous to the cancer cell and only to the cancer cell. There's another important enzyme called rotinase, which we shall identify as the protecting enzyme. The reason is that it has the ability to neutralize cyanide by converting it instantly into byproducts that actually are beneficial and essential for health. This enzyme is found in great quantities in every part of the body except the cancer cell, which consequently is not protected. Here then is a biochemical process that destroys cancer cells while at the same time nourishes and sustains non-cancer cells. It's an intricate and perfect mechanism of nature that simply couldn't have been accidental. There's much speculation today about carcinogens, the things that supposedly cause cancer. We're told that researchers now have proven that smoking or excessive exposure to the sun or chemical additives to our food or even certain viruses all can cause cancer. But as we have seen, the real cause is an enzyme and vitamin deficiency. These other things merely are the specific triggers that start the process. Anything that produces prolonged stress or damage to the body can trigger off the production of estrogen as a part of the healing process. If this goes unchecked because the body lacks the necessary chemical ingredients to fight back, then the result is cancer. Specific carcinogens, therefore, do not cause cancer. They merely determine where it's going to occur. Of course, nature's defenses against cancer include more than just the pancreatic enzymes and vitamin B17. Research has shown that an important role also may be played by other enzymes, other vitamins, oxygenation of the blood, pH levels, and even body temperature. Vitamin B17 seems to be the most vital and direct acting of all these factors, but none of them can be ignored, for they're an interlocking part of the total natural mechanism. Fortunately, it's not necessary for man to understand fully every theoretical aspect of this mechanism in order to make it work for him in practice. All that he really needs to know is the necessity of eating foods rich in all the vitamins and minerals and of minimizing damage or stress to the body. The reality of the vitamin B17 concept of cancer has been proven in the laboratory beyond any doubt. For example, Dr. Dean Burke, head of the cytochemistry section of the National Cancer Institute, has reported that in a series of tests on animal tissue, the B17 had no effect on normal cells but released so much cyanide and benzaldehyde when it came in contact with cancer cells that not one of them could survive. He said, when we add laetrile to a cancer culture under the microscope, we can see the cancer cells dying off like flies. We've said that vitamin B17 is harmless to non-cancer cells. This is true, but perhaps it would be more accurate to say that it's as harmless as any substance can be. After all, even life-essential water, or oxygen, can be fatal if taken in unnaturally large doses. And this is true also of vitamin B17. For example, there is one case of a man who reportedly died from devouring almost a cup of apple seeds. Incidentally, the case never has been authenticated, but assuming it's true, if the man had eaten the apples also, he would have obtained enough extra rotinese from the whole fruit to offset the effect of even that many seeds in his stomach. But that would have required that he eat several cases of apples, which of course would have been impossible in the first place. Nature can do only so much. It cannot anticipate excess of this kind. Therefore, it's wise to follow the simple rule that one should not eat at one time more seeds than he likely would consume if he also were eating a reasonable quantity of the whole fruit. This is a common sense rule with a large safety margin that can be followed with complete confidence. Now when it comes to the laboratory forms of vitamin B17 known as amygdalin or laetril, there's even less cause for concern. For over a hundred years, standard pharmacology reference books have described this substance as non-toxic. After a century of use in all parts of the world, there never has been a single reported case of related death or even serious illness. In one series of tests, 
white rats were fed 70 times.